I'm sure in your childhood you have heard of Asterix, this young Gaulois in a tiny French village resisting every attempt from the powerful Roman Empire to invite them unsuccessfully. Well, that will be Castro Olympique in this crazy era of rugby. Castro Olympique is one of French rugby's oldest clubs created in 1906. They won French top division in three times in the amateur era, the last one in 1993 with XO Black Witten. Or is it Witten? They were still in the first division, and while the likes of Narbonne, Béziers, Bourgoin, Lourdes, Dax, which are cities that have a similar or lower population, all of them are now in the lower divisions, while Castres still remain in the elite of French rugby. In fact, Perpignan, Biarritz, or even Toulon had to do the yo-yo and come back up and down, although they had a very successful time in the top 14. Yet, Castres did not. In fact, they finished their last regular season at the first place in front of Toulouse, La Rochelle or Montpellier and only lost in the final. In the last 10 years, they actually are the team that reached the most top 14 finals ahead of Toulouse. Four finals and won it twice in 2013 and 2018. This is actually a huge feat. But what's more impressive is that they not just managed to stay up but to play the top 14 playoffs almost every season. Actually, top 14 allowing the first 6 teams to take part instead of just 4 teams has been their greatest advantage as apart from last season, they will usually finish between the 4th and 6th place and next season, they will be a top contender. But how? The good old saying, you either adapt or survive, will fit Castres perfectly. Firstly, regarding the coaching staff, they won in 2013 with a great duo Laurent Labitte and Travers, which are renowned coaches now who left for Racing 92, then they get Urios, who made them win in 2018, to now having Eddie Jones' bestie, Bronca. All of these coaches have done well at a lower club or in an assistant role and were promoted to first coach role. But obviously, not all of the coaches that they picked were good, so... They can also equally sack you really quickly if things go sour. I told you, they can adapt. If there is one thing that hasn't changed though, it's how they present themselves and approach games. They love this underdog role as it allows them and their fans to give a little extra 5% that makes a huge difference to make them proud to be the tiny city that beats the big teams of the biggest cities in France. Of course, they tend to see the best players leave to bigger teams for either more money, taking European Cup seriously and more exposure to get into the French squad, for example, Dulon and Jolange. One of their successes is the ability to build up a strong squad. They don't have a strong academy because fairly, which youngsters will want to party with cows, but they can pick the right players with the right mindset in lower division. They didn't follow the likes of Perpignan and Biarritz back when that they follow Tulo and Racing in having strong international players who miss half of the season and get a weaker squad throughout the season. Their current coach actually, in a recent interview, described their recruitment strategy very well. As Castres doesn't have the finances to offer the biggest wages to world-class players, they did this once with Sisi Vatu, but they cannot do this for an entire squad like other teams are doing. Castro's coach said he would rather have nine extra players than a big famous one. A club like Racing 92 will do the opposite, wanting quality over quantity and filling the extra spots with the academy players as they produce a lot of quality players. But is it always better? Castres' strategy is actually very good once again. In the interview, Bronca described that having players coming from lower divisions aren't just cheaper, but they are also less likely to be international players until, well, they eventually become one. So, they stay with you throughout the season, there's no yo-yo there, they all play with Castres throughout the season. And, he's right, Toulon spent a lot of money for Kobe in transfer and wages and he's still missing a big part of the season. The same goes with Pollard when he was at Montpellier. Recruiting from French lower divisions is also great because it is a 30 regular season. It's a very, very long season and players coming up to top 14 will then be used to playing long seasons and know that there are times they will be off the team sheet and know how the winter will force them to adapt their rugby style, which is a big contrast coming from the players from the southern hemisphere that are used to shorter seasons and could take time to adapt to French rugby. For these reasons, all of their recruits are coming from the second and even third division, which compared to the lower divisions of other countries are fully professionals. Pro D2 or Pro D2 is actually a very good competition and it is very underrated. 
but that's another topic. Actually, the likes of Jaminet, Villiers or even Antonio, which won the Six Nations with France, first started in these divisions. So there are some golden gems in Pro D2. Castres recruited seven players from Pro D2 and another two in third division, compared to other teams who probably recruit one or two players maximum from the second division. Castres they fit perfectly. To search for some golden gems, Bronca watches a lot of rugby in different countries, even discovering young talented Nick de Champion de Crepigny watching Australian University League, as well as recruiting some big names that are on the free market like Nakarara for a cheaper salary. This weekend alone, during their defeat against Bordeaux, four out of 15 players came from the second division last season and another one on the bench. That's five out of 23 that came from second division last season. That's quite huge this early on in the season. To Castres, France is already a big territory, so imagine in Europe. Another reason for their constant success is their ability to completely have no European ambition at all. They probably have one of the worst European records, yet still are a big team. I mean, sure, they won the European Shield once and this competition lasted like three seasons? They did achieve to reach a H Cup semi-final in 2001 and two European Challenge Cup in 1997 and 2000. But since then, they ditch any European ambition. I mean, any team competing in the Champions Cup wants to compete and reach the next stage and be disappointed if they get out. But for Castres, it's minor if they get out. It's because they mainly focus on the top 14. While other teams send the best team, Castres will instead rest the best players and allow the ones that play less to play against other bigger positions and get better despite losing, which improved the squad's quality. So, on top of having their full squad throughout most of the season and giving up European Cup games, Castres can fully focus on top 14 and play at 100% on every game of the season, when some teams have got to at times have huge turnover to rest the main players because they will be in an international competition or simply need a rest. If you compare it to their rival Toulouse, aka the Roman Empire of the top 14, which lost against them in the semi-final. Toulouse is for sure the better team, but look at how many games they have played compared to Castres. Toulouse has been the opposite of Castres. For years, they have not been playing two competitions a season like the rest of the top 14. They play three because they miss out a lot of their players throughout the season due to their international commitments and have to juggle through it. Castres plays one competition in a season. In Castres, this idea of focusing on the top 14 is so strong that even the fans are okay with not winning any games in the European Cup, while other teams in the top 14, because they have a strong history with European competition such as Clermont, Toulon or Stade Francais, they are still forced to play European Cup seriously because it's in their DNA and it forces them to lose some strength in the top 14. But still, Toulouse is still on top and one reason why Toulouse was able to win the double in 2021 is that they had so much advance in the end of the season with their spot in the top two secured that they were able to rest the main players after the Six Nations and towards the end of the season to play the big important games. They even lost against Bayern at home which finished the season at the 13th place that year. Last season, however, the spot in the top six was far from being secured. So, as soon as they finished the Six Nations, Dupont and Co had to return to the top 14 and played almost every game until the end, giving us this iconic picture. Don't worry though, they did get some well-deserved long summer rest as they were put aside France's summer tour in Japan. But for Castres, uh, none of that. They are out of the European Cup, no problem, it's in their nature, in fact, it's expected. So, when Toulouse is stressed that they aren't in the top 4 because Six Nations start, for Castres, it's only the beginning of a dominance to stay in the top six. So, how can they remain on top? I kind of forgot to say that Castres is not just famous for its rugby club, but also for being the place where one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies reside. Pierre Frabre, which has been the owner and main sponsor since the end of the 1980s, so you expect them to have a lot of money and to have a lot of famous players and staff, etc. But similar to what Michelin does with Clermont, they are able to pay off the debt of the club and keep it safe economically. Castres doesn't have an important economic local area of businesses or huge match day revenue, but at least the club can go forward with lower income, sure, but also low expenses with a guaranteed back net if you spend too much, which at the end of the day is what any owner does. It's only till recent years with the arrival of American owners and investors companies that sport clubs are used as a way to make money in Europe. Owners were also used as financial backup, at least in rugby, even more so. To this day. 
They will need to keep their finances in check to not overpay certain players and fight golden gems as well as kind of continue to give up European or now international ambition. Since it works, why change it? As long as they don't get ahead of themselves and have this amazing support from Pierre Fabre, they will be okay. Despite Pierre Fabre passing away in 2013. In another 50 years, I'm sure a lot more clubs will have gone down and up a division. But the asterisk of French rugby, however, will remain in France's top division.